Today is May 6, 2018. We are in the Feast of Unleavened Bread studying the historicity of the Exodus. So let's ask our Heavenly Family to guide us in this meeting. Heavenly Family, thank you so very much for helping us to learn to be okay with being corrected and to actually enjoy unlearning what we thought was true and learning things that we never imagined could be true. Please help us tonight to better understand all the principles that govern how we ought to think and behave. Please help us to be impacted by what we learn and help us to think clearly. Thank you. We ask this in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. Amen. Okay, so before really getting into anything related to the Exodus, I just want to mention that today is the day of the wave sheaf offering. And so far as we understand, the wave sheaf is offered in the morning. And uh, last year we talked a bit about the idea of the offering of the wave sheaf and kind of a different element of it from what we had talked about before. So I'll give kind of a brief overview of that. Um, we've often understood the wave sheaf only in terms of grain representing people and the wave sheaf being an initial group of people, the first group to be harvested. But in some of the passages describing the offering of the wave sheaf, particularly Leviticus 23, it kind of implies the eating of grain. And often when grain is being used as a symbol and it is being eaten, it is being used as a symbol for truth. So not only is there a harvest of people, but there is a harvest of truth. And last year we talked about how the offering of the wave sheaf on the first day of the week following the seventh-day Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread seems to have some sort of similarity in meaning to new moons. Because with a new moon, you have fresh fruit from the tree of life eating something new. With the wave sheaf, well, the time the wave sheaf is offered signals the time after which people can begin to eat of the grain of the new harvest. Prior to the offering of the wave sheaf, no one is allowed to eat any grain from the new harvest. It is the first fruits offering. So this kind of implies, well, if grain is representing truth, then perhaps there is some sort of truth that is to be understood or eaten or digested that could not be introduced prior to the wave sheaf day. And after that point, it can be consumed or can be understood and uh, digested, studied, set on our plates, if you will. So, you know, we talked about that last year and how that may be part of the antitypical observance of the priestly law in an annual sense because there's prophetic fulfillments at certain points and significant events in the progress of time but then there's also the annual application of these things. So in contemplating this today, I came to a fuller understanding of what this means and what it doesn't mean and, and all of that. Now, I don't by any means have a full understanding of this aspect of the law, but I have gained a bit fuller understanding than I had last year. And last year, I mentioned something along the lines of 
how this is similar in some ways to new moons, but seems to be different also, but we don't fully understand how it's different. So some of how it's different is what I came to understand a little bit better today. And that is that really when it comes to the new grain to be eaten after the wave sheath is offered, this new grain doesn't really represent exactly the same thing as, let's say, the new fruit from the tree of life because the tree of life is to bring forth a new manner of fruit or new type of fruit every month. Well, with the harvest, it's not really like that. It's not like this is a new grain that we haven't eaten before. It's a new harvest of all the same grains that were eaten the previous year. And ancient Israel, the way that they would do it is they would harvest grain and the grain, of course, would be dry. And so they would keep it in storage vessels and they'd be able to make bread from it throughout the year. And so they could be eating grain. And in fact, we know for sure they were eating grain right up until the day the wave sheep was offered. It's not that they weren't eating grain at all. They were just eating grain from that year's harvest or from the previous year's harvest. And then after the wave sheep was offered, they could start eating the new harvest of grain. But again, the previous year you had barley and wheat and flax and whatever other grains they had. And the next year you have those same grains again but uh, it's just from a different harvest. But practically speaking, all year round, they're able to be eating these grains. So what that indicates is that, antitypically speaking, the eating of the grain of the new harvest doesn't represent necessarily eating wholly new truths. It's not new fruit. But, it does show a new harvest of truth, and that truth may be reminiscent in some way of the truth of the previous year. When I came to realize this, I couldn't help but think of how often it is that when Teresa is editing, (laughs) she'll come across something that it's like, hey, we just talked about this principle just like last night or just, you know, the same day or whatever, Or we'll talk about something in a meeting and a certain principle will come up and Teresa will say like, man, I just was editing a study earlier today and it was the same principle that we were talking about. And often it is principles, not necessarily like the exact same topic or the same scriptures, although sometimes it's that sort of thing too. But it's really interesting how there are certain things that tend to come up. Uh, and often it happens where it's the same time of year, where it's like, okay, this time of year we're talking about this. The next year, around the same time, we're talking about the same principles. So there's some sort of like similarity that's being repeated. Now, one of the aspects that I don't entirely understand in terms of how things differentiate from each other is if there's some sort of inherent difference in the meaning of grain versus fruit. And there might be. Um, Grain is like what you'd use to make your daily bread, the, the stuff that sustains you from day to day that you're eating every day. Whereas fruit from the tree might not be your daily sustenance. So there might be something along the lines of the grains representing the fundamental principles of the message and the fruit, the new fruit from the tree of life is like um, kind of like gems of truth and more specific things like interpretations of certain passages or like, you know, you know, the sorts of things that we talk about on the new moons, like understanding an ode or getting a revelation of some prophecy or some some 
present truth thing that's really instructive for the present, it's often something that goes beyond the understanding of a principle and gets to things that are more specific to a certain doctrine or uh, something prophetic or typological or whatever, you know. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It'll be interesting to see kind of the dynamics of how these two things interrelate. But, you know, basically... Um, it, I'm thinking back to last Wave Sheep Day and we talked about the antitypical Nazarite vow. And that was built upon things that we had already been learning the previous year concerning the priestly law in antitype. But it was introducing a new element in terms of like keeping certain aspects of the law in antitype and really over the course of the year the specifics of different laws and how to keep them in antitype isn't actually something that we learned a whole lot more about but some of the things that we're learning are kind of prerequisite to that in fact what we are studying right now during this feast of unleavened bread is to whatever degree prerequisite to that in that, we're kind of at the place of really trying to understand what really does constitute the law of Moses and what might we have thought to be the law of Moses or parts of the law of Moses that turn out not to be. So, you know, it's kind of like we're going more foundational than understanding the law in antitype. And that's pretty essential. So it's a good thing that we're doing that and it's a necessary step and perhaps the full living out of the priestly law in antitype can really only be accomplished when we understand what actually constitutes the priestly law in type. So that may be one of the major things that has been preventing us from more fully understanding and living out ceremonial law and antitype. In any case, when it comes to the wave sheaf, there are certain things about it that we do know and that we can verify. And of course, Jesus and those who rose with him being the antitypical wave sheaf of those that slept is pretty significant and... um, Obviously, the resurrection of Jesus is a hugely important event and one which we have been able to verify to have actually happened in history. There's just so much that stems from that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of what what it's like this year. I'm sure we'll be learning some of the same principles, but maybe in a new way, you know, a new harvest of these same principles and we we can take it as uh, an opportunity to freshly learn what we should have learned already. And Ellen White talks about the importance of God taking us over the same ground again. If we've gone over a certain ground and haven't fully learned what we were supposed to learn, God will take us over the same ground again. So that may be some of what we are experiencing. And there's something else that I learned earlier today or I had a, like a clearer understanding of that I want to share with you guys as maybe a kind of first installment of our harvest our new harvest of the same types of grains. And it has to do with the the will being the governing power in humanity. And we've talked about this and understood this before. We've read statements from Ellen White and we've really, we have had meetings where we've emphasized the power of choice. But 
that is a lesson which needs to be learned more fully. We need a new harvest of that same grain of truth. And so so a realization that I had is that many in the message who have come to recognize that the message is true and see the truth of justification by faith and that we need to do away with sin in our lives and recognize that the only way for that to take place is a choice. Yet, people find themselves not making that choice and instead choosing to fall to sin. And obviously, people can be discouraged going through an experience like that. And part of the discouragement, a huge part of it, is people feel helpless. So you might feel sometimes like you are doomed to choose to sin again. Like, yeah, you recognize it's a choice, but you feel like it's just inevitable that you'll choose that again. And it's like almost like you can't do anything about it. Like, you're just going to come across a temptation and you're just going to choose to fall to it again. So the realization that I had is that when people are thinking like that, they may call falling to sin a choice, but so long as you are thinking of some sort of potential future sin and your choice in giving into it as inevitable, you actually aren't really thinking of it as a choice. Any choice that is doomed to be made (laughs) isn't really a choice. By definition, a choice is something that is not doomed to be a certain way or uh, someone is not incapable of making a future choice something else. If they were, it wouldn't be a choice. It would just be an inevitable event that they had no power of. So if it is a choice, it means that you do have power over it. And if you find yourself thinking about sin from a powerless perspective, from a perspective where you think, yeah, I recognize it's a choice, but it's just inevitable that I'm going to choose it again. I'm doomed to choose to sin. Recognize that you are not actually thinking of it as a choice and that that is a problem. But recognizing that can help you to solve the problem. If you can recognize, whoa, I'm not really viewing this as a choice. I'm just thinking it's kind of automatic and I'm just going to do it. Well, if you're thinking like that, you'll probably do it because you're not making a choice when you're not actually thinking of it as a choice. So once again, if you are thinking of sin from a powerless perspective, And from an inevitable perspective, realize that you're not actually thinking of it as a choice and that that is a huge part of the problem. So you can actually change how you think about it. And in order to really think of it as a choice, you have to realize, oh, whoa, what it means for this to be a choice is that it is truly up to me. It is truly within my power to be able to do one thing or the other thing. And no matter what I do, it is done because I took matters into my own hands and created the outcome. Because that's, you know, committing sin or acting out righteousness These are things that come about from our choice. The will is the governing agent in the man. So, anyway, I hope that that is a a fresh bite of some barley for you. And while it's the same barley that we eat from year to year, hopefully it has shed a new light on it and you can take that and chew that up and digest that and I'm sure if you do it will sustain you. Amen. So I just want to ask are there any questions or comments on all this and if there aren't 
then, hey, we can dive back into some of the stuff related to the Exodus. That's really important stuff. But, yeah, does anyone have comments or questions? That was really helpful, the way you explained things, Trent. Thank you. Well, praise our Heavenly Family. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you as well. You know, the more that I focus on the idea of it's my life, it hasn't been written out, I can do what I want, and if I want to do good, I can do good, and there's no reason why I can't the more victory that I receive in thought and in feeling, let alone in deed. So I really appreciate the reiteration. It's always good to hear. Amen. Hey, you know, something else that I'll mention here as a quick note, it's a side note, it's not dealing with the Exodus topic specifically, nor is it talking about the choice topic, but it actually has to do with keeping the peace in antitype, and one of the subjects that we have talked about in the past is sacred song, and how music is important in the heavenly government and the heavenly priestly system. And, I mean, you have the 24 elders in Revelation offering up prayers and having incense and playing on harps. That's just one example. But it is very important as part of the antitypical system. And feasts are not just about studying. They aren't just about filling ourselves with ideas. It's about praising our Heavenly Family and playing music and learning how to use music as a tool to minister to others, to minister or to do priestly activity for the sake of others. That's ultimately what priestly activity is about, ministering. So, you know, one of the reasons why we've had shorter meetings tonight is so that people have time to do other things. And one of those other things is playing music. And so I encourage everyone, if you haven't been doing it so far through the feast, to make that a part of the rest of your feast keeping to play music. And if you haven't learned an instrument yet, it's not too late. And... If anything, we all have the instruments of our voices. And, hey, if you have a hard time getting into it, just try different things. Be open. Be experimental. So, anyway, that's my little side note on music. So, with that said, we can kind of focus back in on the Exodus topic. And I will mention a few things about it. And that is simply that, as by way of reminder, we are studying the historicity of the Exodus because of the fact that we've realized we can't just accept the story as we've heard it simply because it's in a certain canonical collection. We've seen that scripture canons are unscriptural, unhelpful, and even harmful. And we have seen that the traditions that we've had about the books within the canons we're familiar with are not always correct. Certainly, the tradition that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible is something which we've found to not be correct. And we found that there's actually a lot of evidence in favor of the documentary hypothesis, which essentially is the idea that the Torah is a composite of four primary texts, which were originally separate documents from one another, 
and then were compiled together along with several other minor writings that were kind of thrown in the mix as well. And because of this, it really changes how we look at all the events described in the Torah because we're learning that really some of the events described in the combined version of the Torah are not at all like that, like how they are in the combined version, within the original source documents. The Exodus is one of those events. And so it raises the question of historicity, what happened, how did it happen. And for our purposes, since we are not just interested in history, we also want to find out what Yahweh's part was in connection with these events. We can see that at least some of these passages connected with the Exodus, I can say that they do misrepresent the character of our Heavenly Family, at least those passages which promote slavery and the beating of slaves, but not necessarily exclusively those passages. So because of that, we really need to find out what our Heavenly Family's role was during this time. And I suppose that's a good point for me to kind of spring into something that we have not specifically discussed so far on the calls. That's actually a really important issue when it comes to the Exodus, and that is the date of the Exodus. When did it happen? So, really, the dates that people give for the Exodus range from the 16th century B.C. until the 12th century B.C. That's a long period of time. When was it actually supposed to be? It's kind of hard to say. One of the reasons why it's hard to say is because the Pharaoh of the Exodus is not mentioned by name in the sources that we have, and that leaves it open to placing the Exodus in different periods. And since there are several Egyptian correlates to certain aspects of the Exodus at different times in Egypt's history, people have connected the story of the Exodus with those events taking place in those various times, again, ranging over a period of at least 400 years and potentially even beyond that. So I just wanted to mention that as another thing that we need to keep in mind and kind of... uh, be open to investigating when we are discussing the Exodus. The question of when, you know, if something took place, when did that thing take place? So, with all that said, does anyone have comments or questions on our investigation of the Exodus so far? Okay, I'm going to ask a question that will just show that I'm not getting something, okay? (laughs) Why is it or is it so important that we know when that song of the sea was written or or when they sang it? I I can understand part of it, but um, is it? vitally important that we know that that i mean i know it's all that's important nothing if if god intended for it to be there it's not unimportant so if we determine that the case then it would behoove us to know um and we have determined that they couldn't hardly write a song and learn it and and sing it you know immediately after like uh friedman says so what part might I be missing there as to just how important it is to know when that took place? 
it's like, what am I not getting here? So I'll just listen. Okay, so um, good questions. And actually, I'm wanting to just leave it open for someone else to answer. You know, so if anyone else here has an answer, feel free to answer those questions. I was thinking that maybe because in the song it talks about this Yahweh doing something. So it's claiming that some God has been um, performing some actions towards certain people. And the whole investigation of the Exodus isn't just about the history, even though we do have to go through the history to find out whether um, these claims are true that um, that the thing that God has done. So I'm thinking that since it talks about God in the song, that it found out maybe if the dating it will help with whether um, with whether like when did God take these actions? Like you know, you could go back into like the history of like the people and the tribes and all the stuff and see like okay, well let's say God performed these actions at a time that these people didn't even exist and so on. So like um, yeah, so like how it kind of helps to figure that part out like. That's what I can understand from it. Okay. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, does that help you to understand why it might be important, Lynn? Or is it still um, kind of vague to you why it'd be important? And also, if anyone has anything else to add to that, that's fine, too. Well, I don't feel that it's not important. I, I know it would have to be or we wouldn't be studying it for one thing and it's it's listed there. Um, it's uh, interesting and beautifully written. However, if the answer is so that we can get a, a hone in on when the exodus happened, then, then I would totally get it. But it, it looks like it's going to be very difficult to find out when it was written and when they actually sang it. And if they sang it a hundred years, well, surely not a hundred years later, but even if it was a year later or five years later, how would we then know for sure when the Exodus actually happened? Like you said, Pharaoh, the Pharaoh wasn't named. So I guess there's just some missing pieces that we just haven't found yet. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it's not important, but how important is it to know? Is that the key that will unlock finding when the exodus took place? Okay, so just to be clear, it didn't come across to me that you were saying that it's unimportant, just strictly that you were trying to find out why it might be important. And so that's really what I was trying to find out. Is what, yeah, why and understand why. It's what Celia yeah. said. Yeah, if, if what Celia said helps you to understand why it might be important. Not necessarily yeah, that, that, that is that helpful. Is, but why. It was kind of a twofold question. Why is it, and, and, um, uh, why, why is it, um, yeah, that wrote wasn't really even a good beginning of the, the question because I know it's important to a certain extent. I guess my, the main, thing I need to know is just how important is it and if the answer is that's the key to unlock when the exodus happened then you know that's great but it's like it just seems like it's a needle in a haystack right now to me and um, that's as far as I can take it I just don't know the degree of importance that it is right at this time So does anyone else have anything to add to that? Is there any chance that if we can pinpoint when the exodus happened, 
it could offer some kind of a type anti-type information for what might come ahead. Because my understanding, ever since I entered the church and from when my mother and my grandmother would talk about uh, Seventh-day Adventism with me growing up, that time prophecies are done. It's more of a see things coming, signs of the times, past a certain point, hindsight's twenty twenty. And based on, you know, with what Victor Howdeth brought to the table um, it, during his ministry, understanding, you know, some of the details in Scripture that point to type and a type of this happened once before, this will happen once again, I think that lays in place no matter no matter what year it did happen or will happen, but is there any chance it could shed some light on the future? Understanding the activity of our Heavenly Family in the past and their plans and how they carried out their plans could very well be helpful in understanding what they intend to do today. That's just another way of saying type and antitype, but the reason why I phrased it in that way is because sometimes people view types as determining the future, when really no future event takes place as kind of like an automatic um, repeat or, or response to a type. It's just our Heavenly Family carrying out a plan at one point People end up not cooperating. The plan is not able to be carried out all the way. Thus, they try the plan again at a later point. Thus, you end up having, you know, what can be called a type and anti-type. So, again, it could very well be helpful to understand really what our Heavenly Family was doing in the past because it's not that there was ever a problem with their plan. It's just problems with those of us through whom they hope to carry it out. Good. Thank you. In reply to Mom's question there as to, like, how important is this? You know, she understands, well, surely it must be important because it's part of our investigation of the Pentateuch. It's important to get to the bottom of this stuff in the account of the Exodus. That's part of the Pentateuchal investigation. So in my thinking of this particular Song of the Sea or the Song of Miriam or however it may be, the way this series of meetings began was with the focus on the principles brought forth at the new moon of this month. So the new moon topic for the first month, the month that we're in now, was dealing with the character of the Father. And so as we continue to partake of that fruit brought forth on the new moon, then, you know, we've carried it into the investigation of the Pentateuch. And trying to really determine what is historical in the Exodus account. And we've already started investigating the Exodus story in the documentary hypothesis sources last year during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we're building upon previous investigation as well. But as we are looking at any of this, it's all with the end result in mind of coming to some sort of better understanding of the character of the Father. So the reason for starting with this song or possibly these songs, if there's actually two songs here, um, is because it's the oldest writing contained in the sources that make up the Pentateuch. So starting there, um, you know, the most ancient source, well, that's a pretty big deal. You know, so 
how important is it? I'd say that's pretty important. And if we can date that, well, we already know that that's the oldest source in the sources. And everything else comes afterward. So again, that's pretty important to be able to date the text. And in order to just try to verify what really happened at the Exodus, well, it's going to be very important to be able to identify which text actually is even historical or contains historical elements. So being able to determine, is this song an accurate historical account of what happened? Because if it is, that's a big deal. And if we can determine that it's not only historical, but that it dates, you know, if, I don't remember, do scholars already know what this dates to? Like, or have an idea? Right, okay, so, yeah, th they do have an idea. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I'm forgetting the exact dates as to when scholars usually place this, but it's typically viewed as being the oldest thing in the Bible. Right. And some date it back to like the 14th century BC or the 13th century BC, you know, around that time. Okay, so if that's verifiable, then the implication of that is that what it's writing about happened before. So you can't write about something that you claim is a historical event, or if it's actually historical, it had to predate the writing. So that would help date the events of the Exodus as well. Um, so That's basically you know, the answer I'm looking for. That's the answer I was looking for. I didn't realize, I forgot if it was mentioned, and I, I kind of remember now that it was, that that was the oldest writing. And um, and if that can be verified, like you said, the Exodus had to come before that. Um, that is, yeah, that really, really sinks in. That, that really helps. Thanks. And go ahead. I, I, I just had to butt in there and say that because, yeah, that that's, really would be the main reason it seems to right now it is anyway the main reason that it sounds uh, so important to know when that was written okay well i don't need to say anything more then here you go yeah so um basically when it comes to dating this uh I just wanted to mention a couple other things. Some scholars do date this song to a later time than the 14th or 13th century. Like some might date it to even after the 10th century. But those who do that do so by claiming that whoever wrote it was basically faking it, you know, faking that it was a very early document, even from the perspective of the 10th century, because the Hebrew of this song is earlier than the 10th century. It goes, again, to like the 14th or 13th centuries. And so, you know, I think in uh, William Propp's lecture, What is the Exodus? at the UCSD Exodus Conference, he mentioned how the question isn't whether the language is very old. Everyone knows it is. The question is, could someone later fake it? So that's one of the issues involved. Also, what I'm about to say isn't different from what's being said so far. But just to kind of highlight it, if the Song of the Sea is our oldest source for the Exodus, and it was written 400 years after the Exodus, let's say, then it's less likely to contain historically accurate information than if it was written 40 years after the Exodus 
again, I'm saying if it's our oldest source, if it's not the oldest source, then is it depending on sources older than it? But so far as scholars have been able to trace so far, this seems to be our oldest source on the Exodus. So, yeah, really, really important in order to date it and to determine what it said, uh, who actually wrote it, if possible, that may or may not be hugely important in terms of the historicity. And then even if it was written 40 years after the event, let's say, or even the same year as, basically we still have to examine the question of historicity and all of that. So any further comments from anyone on this? All right, well, another thing that I'll say in relation to the Song of the Sea is, you know, I've been looking into it a bit over the past several days, of course, and, you know, trying to think clearly and open-mindedly concerning it. And in trying to understand it, since it is used within the J source, I've been looking at other sections of the J document which have relationships to this text. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's worth testing is whether this really is a text which predated J and which J is quoting or whether it's something that J just invented. And again, most scholars would say that J is quoting a text that pre-existed J. And I think that that's correct, not only because of linguistics, and that's one of the main reasons that historians have for accepting that idea, but also in terms of content. While J has some things which are very similar to the Song of the Sea, and it does seem to be using the Song of the Sea as a source, there are also some dissimilarities that seem to indicate that whoever wrote the Song of the Sea is not the author of J. And some of this has to do with exactly how we interpret the tenses in the Song of the Sea as to exactly how this relates, but still, this gives the same general idea. So in Exodus 15, verse 15, it says, Then Edom's chiefs were terrified. Moab's chieftains, trembling, seized them. All Canaan's residents melted. So this is part of the Song of the Sea, and it is describing the reaction to the news of this event at the sea by the Edomites and the Moabites and the Canaanites, and in the previous verse mentioned Philistia as well. Now, there are different intenses, like some translations, instead of having this in past tense, has it in future tense. And, you know, in some of them it comes across like a prediction, in some of them it comes across as a hope, and in some translations it comes across as an already accomplished reality. No matter what the case is, it still presents the idea that the Edomites and the Canaanites and other peoples were terrified or would be terrified by this event. Now, what's interesting is that later in J, it actually specifically describes Israel's interactions with the Canaanites and the Edomites. And... I'll actually just read a little bit to you from what's here in 
uh, later in J concerning this, concerning the Canaanites, we read of this in Numbers 13, verses 27 to 31, and verse 33. And this is a familiar story to us, spies going into the land, uh, they get a uh, cluster of grapes, and it's huge. Um, so anyway, there's, here's the report of these spies. Again, Numbers 13, verses 27 to 31, and then verse 33. And they told him and said, We came to the land where you sent us, and also it's flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nonetheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities fortified, very big. And also we saw the offspring of the giants there. Amalek lives in the land of the Negev, and the Hittite and the Jebusite and the Amorite live in the mountains, and the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. And Caleb quieted the people toward Moses and said, Let's go up and we'll take possession of it because we'll be able to handle it. And the men who went up with him said, We won't be able to go up against the people because they're stronger than we. And we saw the Nephilim there, sons of giants from the Nephilim, and we were like grasshoppers in our eyes. And so were we in their eyes. Now this is really interesting because the Canaanites here do not come across as terrified at all by the Israelites or by what they heard of the event at the Song of the Sea. In fact, the Israelites are totally terrified. And to the Canaanites, according to this text, this J text, the Canaanites viewed the Israelites as like grasshoppers. Like, man, these guys are nothing to be afraid of. So. It's kind of interesting how this passage in J seems to present a slightly different picture than what you get in the Song of the Sea. And likewise, uh, in Numbers 20, verses 14 to 21, it describes Edom's response to the Israelites. And the Israelites are like trying to go through, I won't read the passage right now just because I know we're at the end of our hour, but... The, the Israelites are trying to make passage through the territory of Edom, and Edom is just like, forget you guys, we don't care. <laughs> They're not at all, like, acting afraid or, sure, just don't hurt us or, or whatever. They just seem to not care at all about who the Israelites are and aren't going to make any sort of uh, means for them, or, you know, just... Fear is not at all portrayed. And so far as I was able to find, none of these peoples who are described as being fearful in the Song of the Sea are described as being fearful elsewhere in J. So with that in mind, it might be that the J source, when referring to these other events, like Israel actually arriving in Edom and Moab and so on. It could be that Jay was depending on other sources that gave a different picture than the Song of the Sea, or that Jay simply had different ideas. But it does not seem to be the case that the Song of the Sea and what we find elsewhere in Jay come from the same source. Because of that, it seems very likely that the Song of the Sea is indeed a pre-J source that J is quoting. So anyway, like I said, we are actually at the end of our hour here, so we should bring an end to this meeting, but I hope that was helpful for everyone. And I don't know if um, anyone has any kind of last things to say in relation to what I just mentioned. But if anyone does and wants to say something really quick, I think we can make allowance for that. If it's not going to be really quick, maybe it would be better for tomorrow night or 
on Facebook. And, of course, we can continue our discussion in general on Facebook as well. So with that said, if anyone has last comment, feel free to make it. Otherwise, would anyone like to thank our Heavenly Family? We can answer this tomorrow, but isn't that a problem for the historicity of this song? Um, anyway, I can pray, unless anyone else have a, has any comments. Yeah, that's a great question, and perhaps... People can think more about that until our next meeting, and then that can be kind of the first thing that we can address on tomorrow night's call. Um, discrepancy between Jay and the Song of the Sea, and is that a problem for the historicity of the Song of the Sea? And I'll just add, or is it a problem for the historicity of Jay, or both, or what? <laughs> or maybe the NET translation is right. Anyway. Um, the one that was kind of talking about like wishful thinking that they would be terrified hoping that they would be but not yet were anyway heavenly family i thank you so much for the study and for um the new grain the new um new understandings that you're giving us of the old truth the old and new and uh, we really do appreciate that sister i thank you for for continuing to guide us and to be patient with us and not giving up on us and we just love you so much and um and I thank you for each person on the call. Your hand a blessing upon each one of us. In the name of the branch and sheet, amen. 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 All right. Love you all lots. Have a good night. Amen. Um.